thank you all for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here to the museum. My name is Amy Gilman, and I am the Associate Director of the Museum and the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art, and I had the privilege of being the curator on the Small Worlds exhibition, which included includes the Tumbleweed Tiny House for which you are all here tonight to hear about. Before I introduce our speakers in our program tonight, I want to say a few thank yous. It's always my pleasure to be able to stand up in this kind of space and welcome you on behalf of the museum. There are so many people who work here who make this kind of program and indeed all the programming that we do here happen. And uh, I couldn't be up here and we couldn't be presenting this to you without them. And so you know, next time you see a staff member or a volunteer or one of the ushers here, uh, please you know, express your thanks to them because this is what makes this museum really spectacular. Spectacular. Uh, without it, it would just be a place where we hold paintings and sculpture and you wouldn't be able to get in. So I also want to express uh, thank you to our sponsors for the evening, the Toledo Museum of Art ambassadors who have generously stepped up to sponsor the entire master series for this year. And if there are ambassadors in the audience, would you all stand so we can give you a round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. They're, the Ambassadors are a wonderful organization here, a volunteer organization. They give both of their time and of their money to the museum, and I do know that they are looking for new ambassadors to join them, and if you are interested, you can track some of them down here this evening and, and talk to them about what the Ambassadors do here. So a little bit about Small Worlds before I introduce our speakers. Uh, when I started working on this exhibition, I was really thinking about, uh, first of all, the fact that in contemporary art, so many times artists uh, think about bigger as being more important. And so everything tends to get fairly large, and I really like the idea of uh, small things. But what I found to be more interesting over time was thinking about the idea of smallness rather than everything being miniature, is it's really more about what constitutes a kind of appropriate scale, the way that small things tend to be beautifully designed, and uh, I included a group of artists in this show who all explore those ideas and the idea of what constitutes a small world in different ways. I always knew that I wanted to include a tumbleweed tiny house because I've been very interested in the tiny house movement, the sort of small house movement, uh, as a kind of contrast to the, again, kind of building bigger and bigger homes for us to live in, and how much space do we actually need. If it is beautifully designed space, how small could you get? And the smallest uh, house that I could find is the tumbleweed tiny house, the extra small house that is here at the museum, the 65 square foot house. And I searched around the country for one to borrow for the exhibition because, of course, that's what we do. We borrow things, we bring them into the museum. And I would call people around the country and say, would you lend me your tumbleweed tiny house? And they would say, I'm sorry, I live in it. <laughs> that's kind of a, a roadblock for us. I mean, that would be a different kind of exhibition, I guess. <laughs> So uh, I almost had abandoned the idea of doing, of, of having the house here. I just thought, okay, well, I'll mention it in the essay or I'll talk about it in the show or something. When our chief operating officer, Carol Bentz, uh, grabbed onto this idea and just would not let it go with the tenacity of a chief operating officer, I would say, uh, she called uh, one of our great local companies, the Andersons, and asked them if they would be willing to donate a trailer that we could maybe if we were going to build one, that we could build it on. And she started talking to them about it, and they said, well, we could donate some of the materials, and oh, isn't this great, and look at all these wonderful pictures, and wouldn't this be fun? And then she approached Lathrop Company, which is a construction company here in town, again, fantastic local company, and they build 
buildings, like big buildings and complex construction projects. And she said, would you perhaps be willing to donate some time or would you be interested in getting involved in this? And they completely embraced this. And between the two companies, uh, Anderson's donated the majority of all the materials and Lathrop donated all of the time to make our tiny house. And so before I continue, I just want to show you a little video. You've been watching some of the uh, stills here from the build of the tiny house. We have a little three minute uh, video that we can show right now that will tell you a little bit about the first build that we did for the tiny house. As part of the exhibition Small Worlds, which opens November 18th, the museum partnered with the Andersons and the Lathrop Company to build a house designed by the Tumbleweed Tiny House Company. This is the real house with a working bathroom, kitchen, and a sleeping loft big enough for a queen size bed but it's constructed on a trailer and it's only 65 square feet. The materials were donated by the Anderson's General Store and labor was donated by Lathrop Company employees. At the end of the exhibition in March, the house will be auctioned off to raise money for children's programs at the museum. Although it is truly a tiny house, the construction process was the same as for larger houses. A level floor was built, in this case on the trailer. Wall sections were framed on the floor using two by four lumber. In a larger house, they would be raised up in place, attached to one another, and a sheathing of plywood added. In this case, the walls were small enough that they could be sheathed while the framing was on the trailer, and the walls simply carried out of the way until needed. The construction of the shell was accomplished in a single day in the parking lot of the Anderson store in Maumee, Ohio. Watch the fun! <laughs>
So our speakers tonight, it's a great pleasure to have both of these men here. Steve Litt has been the art and architecture critic for the Cleveland Plain Dealer since 1991. When we started talking about doing this program, Steve was the first person that I thought of because in addition to being uh, very thoughtful about art and art-related subjects uh, in both our area and nationally, is that he's also um, quite an experienced and congenial and very interesting interviewer. And I knew that he and Jay would have a very interesting dialogue here tonight. Jay Schaefer, as many of you I'm sure know, is the founder of the Tumbleweed Tiny House Company. He is frequently credited with being one of the founders of the entire tiny house movement, which is not of course just about living smaller, but about living smaller well. So it's not just about being tiny, but it's also about how do you design things in a beautiful way so that it actually means that you need less space. Jay and Tumbleweed have been featured in the New York Times, on CNN, as part of HGTV's Design Star, and recently as a New Yorker profile. Please join me in welcoming Steve Litt and Jay Schaefer. I don't know where they're coming Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. I have to say, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be in such a great museum and such a great architectural space. Isn't it great to, uh, you know, to have all of this uh, uh, wonderful architecture around us? I love it. It's very museum-y. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before coming here uh, to, to do this uh, event tonight, I, I had some time in the galleries, and I just have to say, you, know, you folks at Toledo are just so lucky to have such a great museum and such a fabulous collection to enjoy. Um, it's, it's always wonderful to come here and see these uh, beautiful things. So, Jay, um, this was my first uh, encounter with your architecture today. I went to uh, climb around the house and look in the sleeping loft and uh, check out the kitchen, look at the, the hot water heater underneath the, uh, uh, the sink in, in, in the back and uh, check out your desk and everything. Um, why small? Why are you so interested in the small house? Where did this idea come from for you? Well, it seems like every time I answer that, I answer it differently because okay. <laughs> there are so many different Great. answers. Yeah, They're all true. Um, but when it comes down to it, I think the original reason was just that the idea of spending a third of my life for 30 years paying off a mortgage on a, a standard house was... It was pretty much terrifying. So, um, and I didn't like the idea of not really owning my own house during that period. I wanted my house my way, and I, don't want it, I wanted that house to be mine. So I guess it's kind of selfish. Did you, were you thinking at all, I mean, did this come out of any relationship to the mortgage foreclosure crisis that we've been in, and uh, the, all the disruption that we've had in the housing market in the United States? Um, or or, you know, or did, I, did your interest predate all of that? It predated all that. I started building my first tiny house in 1999. But it did seem a little, you know, I just could not understand the housing market, and nor do I understand the housing industry very well. Um, uh, I, I guess the only thing I really understand is common sense, it seems. So to me, the idea of buying or putting a lot of my money into an investment of square footage and banking on the idea that that would pay off somehow um, was scary, so I avoided it. And I guess I'm one of the very few people who has benefited from the, uh, the downturn, in the sense that at least, um, at least I, I like to think people are thinking more now about what, um, what use value is, rather than just resale value. And I think that's what I've always been shooting for, so I'm, I'm pretty happy. Did you, did you have clients for these small houses, or did you just t do the first one for yourself? Um, you know, I, I did have a few clients early on, um, not for the first one or the second one, but um, I, uh, I did them all for myself, assuming I was a fairly normal person. I'm average sized. I wanted something to feel good. So I based it on my own human scale, and um, tall people just have to get a stretched out version if they want it. Um, but I have done some, some 
uh, stuff for other folks, and I hate it. I, it's hard for me to design according to other people's um, ideas. You're an architect. You're supposed to work no, for clients. I am not an architect, or I am in the sense that... Uh, no, seriously, are you an architect? Licensed, all of that? No, no, okay. I'm not a real architect in that sense. I guess what I... Uh, I never got formal training. I went to high school. I, got, I, I took architecture one. I think I got a C. And I feel like that's a testament to, um, I, I like to think that talent is really overrated in our culture and that it, it really has to do with passion. So okay. despite and my energy, low grades, I right? kept on going and um, I just kept on designing really, I got smaller and smaller and um, couldn't see any reason to do otherwise. So um, that's okay, my Okay, so I, I want to I place you here. You're, you're from, you're a native of Iowa and you said you spent most of your time growing up in Los Angeles, suburbs of Los Angeles? Yeah, I spent until the age of 14 in LA suburbs. Okay, so the high school where you took architecture one was where? That was in Ames, Iowa, because at okay. 14 I moved back to Iowa back where to I was Iowa. born. Okay. Lived in Ames for a couple of years, went to high school there, and um, eventually moved out to Iowa City where I, I went to college. Okay, and so uh, you became a, a builder? A yeah. carpenter? What, what, what were you doing after college? Inadvertently, I did become a builder eventually because nobody else would build my stuff for the price, well, for free, which is what I wanted. <laughs> and, and I did go through, um, you know, with a, an art degree, which is what I got. I got a, a bachelor's in drawing. And where uh, was that? University of Iowa. Okay. My master's came from uh, City College of New York. And with those degrees, I got a job in a grocery store for 10 years. And um, during those years at the grocery store, I started really honing in. Well, actually, I was closeted in my design of tiny houses. It didn't seem practical. It was a way for me to avoid doing laundry. So uh, where, and where was this all happening? Almost all of this was in Iowa City, except for okay. the two years I spent in New York City um, going to grad school. All right, so you're thinking about dwelling. Did you own a piece of land? I did not. That was another reason why I wanted to build small and on wheels. Oh, um, okay. I didn't want to anchor anything down because I didn't necessarily have any land. Right. Which got interesting because I found out you couldn't just live anywhere in a tiny house. You actually did need to have a piece of land right. or at least be able to live in a friend's backyard. Which works very well too. Okay. So the very first little house, small house, where was it? Well, I... Um, I skipped over a little part. I lived in an Airstream trailer for a couple of years as a test run. Mm -hmm. That was out in a hay field, living off grid, carrying in water, solar panels, the works. And, you know, after a couple of years without insulation, I was really eager to build something similar, but with insulation and a bit more vernacular in its hominess. Right, right. Okay. So, uh, and then, the, so this first house was in Iowa, in the Ames area. Um, I should mention I did move to Iowa City to go to school, so I built it just outside of Iowa City, six miles outside of town in a hayfield. And were you, uh, were you reading uh, about other people doing small houses at the time? Did you have any sense that you were part of something in the culture, something in the zeitgeist? Um, well, in my tiny zeitgeist, um, maybe not at large, but there, were, there was a book called Tiny Houses by Lester Walker, which was very inspiring, a bunch okay. of pictures of... 40-something tiny houses. And when I started really focusing on actually building the thing, I started re reading uh, Michael Pollan's uh, uh, House of My Own or A Price right. of My Own. Yes. Yeah. And that was inspiring. Okay. So, so there were some things out there, but uh, were you surprised that uh, uh, your house got attention and eventually you wrote a book and that it became this phenomenon? Um, I never know how to answer that. It seems like I should say no and sound modest and say I'd never imagine being famous. But I had this inkling early on that <clears throat> there was a bit of a, there was no more, from my perspective, the, the, the McMansion thing was the only game in town and there had to be other folks out there who were interested in living simply. So I figured that it might go somewhere. I didn't realize it would go, you know, it turned into a, a so-called movement. Right. You did foresee the bubble. I wish I could say I did. I would have made probably a lot of money if I'd foreseen the bubble. Right, right. Or at least saved a lot of money, but um, no. And that, uh, it works out pretty well for right, right. common sense anyway. So uh, sometimes when I, I talk to architects and they talk about their 
their projects, uh, and they're designing something that is um, uh, of a theoretical nature. Uh, they think about the client, the person who's going to live in the house. And I had the sense when I was in the small house today that this person who is going to live in this house has a biography and that you know the biography. Could you tell us about who this person is? It sounds like you're referring to like a hobbit, but I, um, I usually, I do, I've always looked at the universal and I love shooting for the most universal elements in art and architecture yeah. and eliminating anything personal. Okay. Um, and I don't think that my needs are particularly minimalist. Um, you would think so, but um, I really wanted to see what was really necessary to living well without a lot of extra stuff, which would prevent living well because you'd have to take care of that and pay for that. So the person I'm thinking of is, I guess it's always uh, with every architect or artist, an idealized version of yourself. And, um, and yet, I didn't think everybody was meant to live in 100 square feet or even 60 square feet. So, you know, I've designed houses for families, too, that are maybe 800 square feet. Okay. So, uh, I'll try to flesh this out a little bit myself, because I, I was thinking about this person. And I was wondering, does this person ride a bike? Does this person have a car? How does this person get around? Were, did, were you thinking about that? I was. You know, I was living so simply at um, points in my life, um, essentially homeless, but living in the back of the truck, which seemed rather nice compared to other folks who were living out there. And after that, everything seems very luxurious. And so I was really thinking about knowing that people don't need much. Anybody who's gone camping for a week, especially backpacking and lugged their stuff up the hill, realizes that stuff is a liability if it's not really necessary. So I was building for people who would uh, recognize that necessity really should be the guide mm -hmm. and, and not necessarily uh, acquisition. I'm getting this really strong Walden Pond uh, <laughs> vibe. <laughs> yeah, Walden Pond was inspiring. You know, none of this is new. It seems yeah. like uh, a lot of people see the small house movement as a very novel thing, but in the old days, people lived this way all the time. Well, wasn't it Mies van der Rohe? You knew this moment was coming, right? Mies van der Rohe said less is more. Yeah. And I, but I don't think he meant this. No. <laughs> he was like cutting off the edges, and I, I, like, yeah, I like to keep the edges, yeah. but... Uh, Just skin and bones and glass and steel and make it as big as you want. But that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about getting back to essentials, simplifying your life. And the person who lives in this, uh, in this house is leading a very simple existence. Yeah, and identifying, the hardest part about living simply, I think, is really identifying what you need to be happy and get a, getting rid of the rest. That's the first step and it is the, the hardest, at least for me it, it was. And it's an ongoing process, but um, you know, looking at modernism, for example, right. I would keep some things and get rid of other things, uh, as opposed to just the cube. I like a pitched roof because it sheds the elements. I like the eaves because they shed the elements. And a lot of this stuff is psychological too. I just uh, really am a fan of archetypal ideas of home, so I like to include those things. Well, those things happen to be the things that we identify with home, too. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, you know, I, I think the great appeal of this, this house is that it, it takes so many things that are symbolic of our idea of home in America, and it shrinks them down into this irreducible package. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm looking for, the essence. And if there's a part that needs to go in the house that doesn't seem archetypal, I have to hide it. Like a thermostat doesn't seem very homey. So I put my thermostat in the cabinet, which is a big mistake because then you go out for dinner the first night, you turn on the heater and you get back and it's like a sauna inside. <laughs> so sometimes, there's a balance. There's been some trial and error. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Um, so uh, uh, your, your person, your dweller in this house, can't entertain? I wouldn't say they can't because um, I guess with all the money you save on a mortgage or rent, you could just rent out the Holiday Inn. Um, <laughs> or if it's nice outside, you, you can eat out a lot, right? You eat out a lot. I, I ate out a lot most of my adult life, so I never really put much stock in a large kitchen, though I do design large kitchens for folks I assume do actually cook more than I do, right. which a lot do. Um, but yeah. So this is a house for one person. Could there be a house for two people? 
Yeah, I mean, some people take these really tiny ones I've designed and put two or three people in them, which wouldn't work for me personally. Yeah. I need private space. Yeah. And I think private space within a house makes the house feel much bigger. So uh, in every larger like family house I design, um, I'm always sure to include what's intended as a bedroom for every intended occupant. So you do design houses that are like regular houses? Regular in the, well, I guess not regular because they're still about uh, one third the size of the average American house, but uh, they look pretty regular. And you have a clientele for this? There's a lot of people coming to you and saying, I want to live at one third the normal scale? I, that I am surprised by. I didn't ever expect the, um, the number of people who are into the idea of living small. I didn't expect that kind of a response to that degree, but I, um, I guess it's, uh, you know, I also, uh, I, 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 I'm basically selling to dreamers too. That's our primary um, clientele. People who are into the idea of living small. So the book sells a lot and we certainly sell a lot more workshops. We make more money selling books and workshops than we sell houses or make yeah. money selling houses because people love the idea. And then they take off and, uh, and turn it into their own thing from there. You know, I was also thinking that there's, there's some kind of larger statement about uh, our culture and consumerism and how we see the environment and uh, whether we think growth is always possible on the planet. You know, we're just going to keep consuming more and more and more, more oil, uh, more energy, whatever. Were you, were you thinking about that and think, I know, I want to turn this conversation in a different direction? I was thinking about that. I, was, uh, I don't know what the impetus was. I know that I was raised in Southern California during the big drought in the 70s, so conservation was a big subject in school. And I was uh, the guy who vacuumed and cleaned the bathrooms in my parents' house of 4,000 square feet, along with my sister. And I'm sure all of that, um, you know, Thoreau, speaking of Thoreau, yeah. he, uh, he says economy is really just um, the, um, the amount of life that you're putting into something is the real cost of something. It's not just the money, it's the time, it's the everything. It's basically the prostitution that you're willing to do to have this or that, and I wanted to minimize that. Right, so uh, I'm also uh, thinking about what are the implications of this house, this tiny, tiny unit that you're putting on a piece of land somewhere, and what you said about looking at the total cost of something, which is the carrying cost of the mortgage and what it costs you to maintain it. The, the really the biggest element uh, after uh, the shelter cost itself is transportation to get where you need to go and how far out you are. And most people don't put those two, two things together and they figure the cost of living. Were you thinking about where would you put these houses and are they part of that conversation about um, what our communities are shaped like in the United States? Yeah, I was um, really thinking about that because A, I was raised in the suburbs and which are designed for cars, right. to actually designed to perpetuate consumption, um, and I, was, uh, I lived in that Airstream and built my house six miles from town, and while I was trying to be sustainable, I was driving six miles in and out every day at least once. Right, right. And so, um, so there's, I, there's your carbon footprint right there. You right. haven't gained anything by having the little house. I wasn't even balancing out at that. Yeah, right. So um, I do imagine these houses being... Uh, I think that, that small houses work best in tandem with other small houses, yeah, so okay. I love the idea of a little village. Is there one? There are little villages, although not little they're not done perfectly. <laughs> it's like not by me yet. Yeah. And every time I see something that's really cool, I think, oh, that's really cool, now I want to do a little better, because I think I, this could be tucked in over here, or that could be done over there. So you want to design a, a small community? I do. I'm uh, actually talking with Sonoma County, which is where I live right okay. now, in California about um, a little village of, of houses. I would call it Napoleon Complex. I, and, uh, and the subtitle is uh, Co-Housing for the Antisocial. <laughs> because they, uh, people could socialize in the spaces between these little houses. Right. right, it's conducive to socializing, but with plenty of private space because I'm a bit of an introvert and um, never liked being for, you know, Right. Elected company is usually the best company. Okay. So let's talk some more about this community you want to build. 
I wish uh, you had a sketch pad here. We could just blow that up on the screen and you know have you draw in front of everybody. But if you can do that verbally for me, uh, what what does the little community look like? How close are these houses? What what are their yards like? What is the street network like? Have you thought about those things? Oh yeah, I think I've been thinking about that stuff for over a decade. That's my oh, real. Great. You know, tiny houses are just the first step. Then um, I really. I waste a lot of time, or at least spend a lot of time, designing little house communities. I've designed hundreds. They, they haven't been built, but now, um, now I'm actually talking the real deal with the county and all. And I, I think um, it's the same principles as those that go into designing a small house. It's just um, keeping everything tight, but designing well so nothing feels crowded. People actually like a sense of containment, psychologically speaking. In general, we like that. We don't like feeling crowded, so it's a matter of, for one thing, keeping the cars out back. You know, I, I don't like the cars out front. You know, by the way, this will be okay, a trailer so park. How big is the lot that this house goes on in, in your neighborhood? About 1,000 square feet. Very small. Smaller than most houses. Okay, so half the size how much across the front? To get the, you've got to get the car back into the backyard. No, right? there's no, you, I think all the parking will be shared, but nobody has to walk more than like 70 or 80 feet to get to their okay. house, thereby avoiding all that space that's taken up by driveways. You know, one of my least favorite elements in a house, because I'm into the archetypal, is the garage door that looks, makes it look like cars live there, but right. not people. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, what do they call those houses? Oh, I don't know. I, I, there are a lot of snout things. houses, I think. Uh huh. <laughs> Something you know, because the the garage comes out and it looks like a snout. They're everywhere. Yeah, yeah, they're terrible. Um, okay, so uh, you're you're talking about sharing space, and these things are going to be really compact on on a thousand square feet. Um, where should this kind of settlement be in an urban region? Is it close to the center of the region? Could you put them out? Ideally, it would be right in town as yeah. infill rather than sprawling outward. That said, zoning for a trailer park is not easy sometimes. I'm surprised my county is really embracing the idea and pushing for the trailer park zoning. Oh, these things are going to be on trailers. Yeah. I figure, I mean, it's, um, I would go either way with the zoning. You could take it off the trailer or you could put it on the trailer. They're about 400 square feet each. But it just turns out that um, zoning a trailer park is more affordable and easier in this case than anything else. So that's what I'm shooting for. Right, right. So maybe the trailer park owner gets more profit out of this because they get more units on, on a piece. There's your incentive. Well, yeah. There would, um, pr preferably there would be some profit involved. I'm not shooting for a lot of profit myself, but I do want to show, you know, it's important that builders see that it would be profitable so that this could be a model for other villages. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I, I guess I, I, in my mind's eye, I want to see you do a, a neighborhood where the spaces between the houses and you know everything, the sidewalks, the curbs, the landscaping, is as carefully figured out and precisely fitted together as everything in the house. It is. It's like, uh, it, composition in my head is everything. Yeah. If one part isn't fitting with the other parts, then it's not working in my head. So what we're seeing in this small house that's out in front of the museum is the result of a lot of trial and er error. Yeah, a lot of, uh, it seems like a lot more eraser goes into my drawings than, than pencil lead. Yeah. Um, and that actually is a house I lived in. I, not that particular house, but that design I lived in for about a year. And aside from that, I lived in a house just uh, a little bigger than that, about 100 square feet for maybe 10 years. Was it hard to figure out how all of those details fit, fit together like, like pieces in a watch? It, it is difficult, but it's, uh, it's fun. I, can't, I think it's an addiction for me. It's just the way I ignore the things I don't want to look at in You're the rest of, of life. Reducing <laughs> things down, down to essences. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a lot of fun. It's like Tetris. I've never even played Tetris, but I'm told it is like Tetris. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, so, uh, would you ever want to do anything big? Is that just completely anathema to you? Well, you know, I've always protected myself, or at least tried to preserve um, the small house movement sort of thing from um, exclusivity by saying any house is a small house as long as the space is being used well. And space being used well in a house, that just means making the occupants happy and keeping them dry and all that. Mm -hmm. So some, some folks may need 5,000 square feet for two people to feel happy, and, and I don't begrudge them that. I think that um, I would do a large house if 
the space was being used well, and I actually thought it was. I don't really think most houses need to be, you know, 2,300 2, square feet is the average these days. And I, I think that um, we could pare it down a bit. Yeah, that's a lot. Now, the, the person who's living in, in this house that, uh, that we're talking about here at the Art Museum is solo, going solo to cite the title of the, the new book that's uh, out about this phenomenon. Were you thinking about that, that people would be, uh, people living on their own would be a rising uh, portion of our population? Yeah, it was already going that direction back in 99 when I built it. And also, um, because I just like to think everybody's just like me and I was single, I figured um, there was definitely an application there. And, you know, if I had my dithers, a family would be living in three tiny houses, at least my family. Mm -hmm. um, for the private space and, and all that. Yeah, wow. So, you know, it just, it's amazing that you kind of intuited all of this, uh, all of these things that were happening in the culture and just kind of hit the nail on the head with this, uh, with this project. Yeah, I think, um, you know, our cleverest things come out of our weaknesses and I'm, I, uh, I have a good sense for space and, and some other things and common sense is, is, I have a fairly good grasp on that overall, it turns out. But um, my inability to actually follow um, other things and uh, slowness in other areas has actually led me to this place where it seems like I was thinking really um, ahead of the game. But I was just... Uh, Are you surprised? I am a little surprised now that I'm sitting here talking to you at this very moment, I'm surprised. <laughs> I was actually surprised when I came to this museum and I saw my house at a museum. And I'm, I was, you know, I was an art major and a a professor at the University of Iowa for 10 years in the art program. And I, I'm just surprised I had to get out of art in order to get my work into a museum. So <laughs> I, I can die now. <laughs> that is what we call a quote. That's, that's great. Um, did you have a, a chance to look at the rest of the exhibition? I did. And? and I love it. And tell, so tell me about how you think you fit into this exhibition. You know, some of the other artists are uh, Charles Conwisher, his drawings are talking about uh, houses in a mile radius around, around the museum, and it looks like the classic uh, contemporary Midwest industrial uh, uh, urban community where uh, there are a lot of vacant lots and uh, houses have been demolished and the community is kind of thinning out. That's a kind of a somber uh, message there. And then we have... Um, uh, blanking on the name because all of these artists are new to me. Uh, Lori Nix, thank you, thank you. Lori Nix who is creating these uh, small tableaus of these imaginary architectural settings from which people have vanished as if there's been this neutron bomb and nature is coming back. It's like the world without us to talk about another, another book. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you think this is a kind of a, a downer in, in a way? I like downers. I, I guess uh, I watch a lot of very dark movies, and uh -huh. it totally depresses me, and I love that. It's, uh, you know, I'd rather, if there's a roar and it's scary, I'd rather face it. It's scary or looking away, but I do think uh, there's, there might be some, some truth in that stuff, because I, I worry that the sub, I don't know where our suburbs are going to go exactly, but if you look at maybe Russia, Right. With their boom and then their bust, you know, they go in and recycle the places or turn the, uh, the McMansions into tenement housing. And in the end, I wouldn't really want to live there, but I do like to imagine there's some way to make use of this space if it becomes irrelevant. Well, I, I think the, the artists are, are, some of the artists are, are giving us a sobering message, but yours seems to be about uh, the hope of living a, a truly complete life on, on a smaller scale. Yeah, that's true. I, I think I'm, a, I'm kind of an angry person. You wouldn't guess it by You don't seem me. angry at all. <laughs> that's because I vent, angry. It. <laughs> I vent it. I uh, vent it, and I'm told by my therapist that you should have fun if you're angry. Make sure your anger is fun. <laughs> so I'm always uh, trying to have a good time, you know, dissing the man by saying small is good. Yeah, yeah. And so, so you're angry about uh, our supersized society. Yeah, that's probably the hard part. If I had to boil it down to, um, well, it's, it pisses me off that people are, in, in essence, forced to live in larger houses because there are laws prohibiting small houses, at least in building code. It makes it very difficult to live simply. And very conveniently, these codes are developed by the housing industry. 
And very conveniently, it drives our entire economy. Once you've got that big house, it's more trips to Ikea. And not that I don't love going to Ikea and I don't have my own consumption issues, but um, I don't like it forced on me. So uh, you would like to see the entire economy turned in a different direction? I would, and I think it is. I'm encouraged to see that things are turning around. I know it doesn't look good right now, but it is always, it's always darkest before it gets completely black, as I've heard it said. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> or before the dawn, so I'm hoping it's the dawn instead of the black. So, uh, do you think this is coming out in the presidential election, uh, the campaigns that, are, uh, that we're discussing so much now, uh, this spectrum between the Occupy movement and, and the Tea Party, which wants smaller government, uh, and the Occupy folks that are so frustrated with uh, uh, government that seems to be tilting in the favor of uh, the wealthy, uh, minority, the very small minority. Are there any themes there that, that you think your architecture, your, your houses are talking about? Yeah, I think it's the same thing. I don't know much about the Tea Party actually, but I do know I um, have talked with the organizers at um, Occupy a bit. In fact, we're going to bring a house into uh, Wall Street until the cops stopped us. But, uh, but I'm, I'm totally on board with that, that sort of thing. I think it's all it's all going in that direction. It's encouraging to, to see people standing up and thinking about what some of the problems are, whereas before, from, from my limited perspective, it just seemed like people were kind of going with the flow. And I guess that's easier to do when, when you don't have financial strife. So what, what, should, what conversation should we ha be having about our, our settlement patterns and energy usage uh, in this uh, presidential season? What's missing from the conversation? I wish I could tell you because I'm not keeping up very well yet. I, I'm, I always wait till the last few weeks so I don't have to go through the months and months of dep that kind of dark movie I don't like to see. So right. Um, <laughs> You're not following these, all these Republican debates and everything? Not so much. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and it could be so easily boiled down to this is more efficient. Um, terms like green or sustain sustainable are really just saying more efficient. So there's a lot of greenwashing going on, and there's a lot of green talking going on. Why don't you explain what greenwashing is? Greenwashing is like uh, everything, not everything, but most products in our culture are green now, even if they haven't changed at all since what they were before. Um, I found a bottle of... Uh, <laughs> I found a bottle of water imported from Japan or Fiji or somewhere next to my hotel room sink and it has this big sticker on it that says, this is the sustainable option and it's sitting next to the sink with the tap water that comes straight from the local source. I never even read the tag, but I knew that was greenwashing right there. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, uh, have you done any energy audits on your houses? Have you, you know, figured out, do they have a lead rating? I suppose I should explain that LEED is the, uh, there's an organization in Washington called the, the U.S. Green Building Council that uh, has figured out how to uh, rate the energy efficiency of, of uh, different types of buildings. And uh, they do this through a system they call Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, or LEED. Have, have your houses uh, had a LEED rating? No, I... Um I always figure my, my rating system is better than anybody else's. <laughs> okay. Because, um, I mean, it's always a bit of a compromise when you have, it's almost always got to be an additive system. Like, if you get more solar panels, you get a higher rating. If you get more um, insulation, but ultimately the best thing you can do is get less, just be more efficient, and that's a very hard thing to rate. So, I've never been all so that So, what does interested. it cost to operate? one of these houses. Have you done them in different climates and heating yeah. and cooling, winter, summer? I did What's one not too far from this latitude in Iowa. That's where I lived for five years in my first house. Mm -hmm. And I was only spending $160 on uh, heating fuel per year to keep it nice and toasty. Wow. Um, and that was about five years ago, I guess. Okay. And, um, and I've never done the science to say it's this many BTUs or whatnot, but I just know that it's for what most people pay in a month, uh, I pay in a year. Wow. So, uh, is it hot sleeping up in that loft? You know, it could be. And in fact, because you, you got that, you're close to the the roof uh, surface that's picking up all the heat from the sun all day long, and it's going to radiate that back in, right? Well, actually, the um, I've got so much insulation in the roofs. It's not even that much, but it's enough to uh, make a big difference. It did look kind of beefy. 
Yeah, it's a little beefy for a tiny structure. Yeah. And it turns out, you know, you don't need that much insulation in a small structure. Like, think of a car and how much insulation's in mm -hmm. there. Um, and then it becomes another cost-benefit analysis where you're like, oh, should I take up inches with more insulation or should I give myself more space? And in the end, um, if you're only spending $160 a year and, and putting out that much in terms of greenhouse gases, it, it, I, I would rather go for the couple of inches, really. Right, right. So, anyway, back to sleeping up there. Is it hot in the summer? It could be. Like in Iowa or here where it gets humid and hot, um, it could be if I didn't have a fan, a mechanical fan sucking air through my loft. It turns into a wind tunnel. Wow. Yeah. Now, I, I, I do have to say that I opened some of the windows, and uh, while the air was kind of static and still when I first went in, uh, and I opened the windows, it was like, whew, air went right through. It ventilates beautifully. Yeah, it doesn't take long to air out 60 square feet. Yeah. You know, you open the door, yeah, the exchange rate. The exchange happens very, when you open the door and get back. Yeah, <laughs> and close it. Um, so, uh, how do you think most people would feel about having the toilet in the shower? With the shower, like, coming down on the toilet? Once again, it's not ideal. And, um, and I've done that in a few houses where um, I really want to save space. Like, that one out front is very efficient in the sense that it's a oh, wet yeah. bath. Oh, yeah. But I don't even like having the, bath, the, to the toilet in the shower if I don't have to. Right. And when I do, I put a curtain over the toilet so it doesn't get all wet. Right. Um, now I'm really excited because I'm designing houses in which I think I've designed the world's smallest bathtub, if I'm not mistaken. But um, it couldn't be much smaller because my, my business partner, who's tall, gets stuck in it when he puts <laughs> in there. So we have to do a larger version, too. But um, it's only like two and a half by two feet. And that could be in the same size bathroom with a toilet. So I'm, I'm always refining these things. Yeah, so you have to have a little floor space to get in there. Yeah, just a tiny bit of floor space between the two, the toilet wow. and the shower. Yeah. Um, and, and the kitchen has a hot plate. Yep. In the case of most of my kitchens just have a hot plate because at least um, in the tiny ones on wheels, it saves so much space. I didn't look at food storage. Was there a lot of space for that? You know, in most of them, the tiny ones anyway, I put in a little under-the-counter refrigerator. I did see that. Yeah. And then, and then there are shelves and cabinets around, too. It's not, you know, I wouldn't want to be out there in some sort of holocaust uh, with no food, because you wouldn't have as much food as your neighbors with the giant pantry next door, in which case it's good to be good neighbors with people with McMansions. <laughs> okay, well, you know, to get back to the person that's living in this house, I think that they have to be kind of a sociable type, because you're, you know, if you're just living in that small space, you know, uh, where you can't really have a guest because it's not that comfortable, it's only, you know, so many places where you can sit down, and there's only room for one to be eating. At, at your, you're going to eat at your desk, right? Yeah, but there is a fold-out table, which I never use. So I have had people oh, over for pizza. <laughs> Four people at a time in a, in a uh -huh. pinch. Oh, and you get a poker game going, too. Yeah, it's fun to have the pizza guy show up, and yeah. he's just freaking Great. out. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the right house. Wait, <laughs> does the pizza box fit in the house? Yeah, you have to turn it diagonally <laughs> to get through the door. <laughs> and he can't come in. He's got he's to stay outside. Uh, so, now I was thinking that the, the person who lives in this house is really going to get the, all their social needs met somewhere else. Most of them, yeah. I, I think it's an advantage if, because I'm somewhat introverted, but I do rely on socializing to stay sane, as many of us do. So, uh, as my friend Greg Johnson, who was my first customer and now the president of the Small House Society, says, you just outsource your life. You just use the, the outdoors as your living room and use restaurants as your dining room. You can eat in, too, but um, if you want to really socialize and be a part of the, th the community, it's not hard with a small house. So to me, this is a house for a, a civic activist. That's what it looks like. I would love to think so. I think um, it feels like it sometimes. I guess part of the reason I got into living small was just because when I found out it was illegal, I had to live small. <laughs> it's like civil disobedience. But, you know, civil activists, um, politically aware people tend to live in them, but then it, they're really for anybody who just wants to live simply, I think. Right, right. And now, tell us more about the small house movement. How big is it? Who are some of the folks involved? I wish I could tell you. I, I actually couldn't believe it was really a movement. I started hearing that phrase going around a few years ago, and it seemed just like, you know, like if you're, if you're working in a grocery store, as I did, and somebody ta starts talking about how cool the cheese department is where I worked. It's, it just feels the same if you're leading a, a movement outside of that. It's just like the people who are close to you mention that, and you're like, oh my gosh, it's cool, it's a movement. 
So, so does the small house movement meet in some giant convention center or something right. to, to get together and say, how are we going to make a small convention center? You know, it's funny you should say that. Just last weekend, we f a bunch of us finally got together in Seattle. Uh -huh. A lot of the more prominent people who, who put themselves out there. And it was fun because a lot of them are very charismatic people. So I, I've never laughed so hard for many, so and many days. Are, are they all just designing houses or are there other building types that they're looking at? Well, you know, um, the best thing you can do if you want to live sustainably is not build a new house, but take a pre-existing space, That's right. preferably right. small and efficient. But, um, but not everybody wants to do that. So I, I, for one, am a big fan of like freestanding house that's iconic of home, even though it's better to share walls like in an apartment building if you can. But, you know, you got to really choose what makes you happy. Otherwise, it's not going to be sustained for long. Do you think you'd be interested in designing a small apartment building? You just, uh, you're, you're reading my, have you been watching me? Because I actually have designed, <laughs> for a long time I was, no, I, I was I'm only part designing. of the same environment <laughs> that we all are. So I think this is sort of natural to yeah, ask these questions. I designed villages of little uh, townhouses, but I like European streets, the windy streets. So I do a lot of those because they feel more contained, you know. Hmm. So kind of a medieval urbanism. A medieval walled town, which I guess turns right. out to be a gated community, which I, I don't like the name of, but it just, it, I kind of like the, the feel of the walled town. Yeah, that's, that's the 21st century automobile-oriented uh, version of it. But, uh, right. Well, well we, we'd park outside the walls. So. We, we all love those beautiful Italian hill towns, don't we? Yeah, They're I just do. so beautiful. Yeah, efficiency. Do you, uh, are there any ones in particular that come to mind? I don't as get a, over to that side of the pond very often. Um, I, I just don't have much time or the resources. So I actually, my favorite is just Quebec City because it's the only one on this side mm -hmm. of the pond that's really um, medieval walled town you know, that so, I know of anyway. What's so interesting about that analogy is that uh, those environments are all uh, s sort of the, the product of anonymous carpenters and stonemasons and builders who don't have names. We don't know who those people are that designed those beautiful environments that have lasted for so long. That's my favorite kind of artist, the, uh, the vernacular building for common people. Common people building for common people. Um, I'm more a fan of pre-Renaissance art where the focus was on um, making something that functioned, you know, usually a religious function in the case of religious works or artworks. But, um, and I love vernacular architecture, just the simple stuff, usually predating, uh, you know, the 50s where, where tract housing really kicked in. So where do you go for inspiration? Can you think of some specific places in the United States that it's, particularly excite your imagination? It's really lucky I don't have to go far. I live in Sonoma County and there are a ton of little, I like craftsman style stuff. It's very related, it's very vernacular, and um, I like the towns, like I went to Nantucket this year, mm. like the towns with the narrow streets and the tiny houses. Now they have huge houses there too, but I go to the tiny house neighborhoods, and that really inspires me. Hmm. Um, uh, I'm, I'm out of questions for a moment, but <laughs> I'm <laughs> You told me to go to roll. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. Yes. Okay, great. Um, is there anyone that you read uh, that, uh, who's writing about all of this? Um, me. <laughs> Actually, it's funny because I don't read much. I have a, um, a minor learning disability that just makes me an incredibly slow reader. So I prefer my medium on, uh, in movies and in uh, audio books, you know. And, um, and yet I love writing. So, but I can write really slow and it doesn't seem to matter. So um, I do like to, you know, I, I, I look at so many pictures. When it comes to inspiration for this sort of thing, it really is very visual and very right-brained for me. And um, I, I, sometimes I like to think that this whole thing for me is just a retribution uh, uh, placed upon the left-brain culture we live in. And it's like taking back right-brain rights, you know. So yeah. yeah. And... Uh, 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 not not participating in everything that you feel you're supposed to participate in. Yeah, it's hard not to participate in a lot of the things. It's hard to escape society, and you never really do. Always, we're a product of the society we're, we're in, but um, it's hard to get out of that system. I found, you know, paring down, you know, it's really hard to get rid of your utilities if you want to use solar panels. Uh, so... 
it, it's kind of fun though, because when they say you're not allowed to do it, then it gets uh, it gets to be a challenge. Yeah. So uh, you're you're uh, disturbed by by things like uh, hearing that uh, uh, an oil pipeline needs to go across the the middle of the country to keep. Yeah, that, going. that is one. Uh, problem, one of the many problems we have in our consumptive culture is, of course, probably one of the biggest problems is just our, our use of um, fossil fuels. And, you know, just watching how much strife has occurred because of our drive towards fossil fuels. You know, Iraq war, oh, many wars actually, and um, just how much uh, human life and quality of life could be saved if if we just focused on what is what truly makes us happy and got rid of the rest of the crap. You know, you're, you're smiling when you say this, and I think there's potential to be enormously angry about this. Are, are you angry at some level about this? Um, I smile about it, and I'm angry at the same time. I think yeah. it's, uh, you know, at some point it's almost comical, and it is in some ways. It's, it, it, you know, if I could stand back in maybe a few hundred years, it might seem comical, and I like to, uh, I like to think that things will change. It, it is, it is, difficult to be forced in, to be in a society that is so um, addicted. We are almost all as individuals, it seems we have a lot of addiction, and then as a culture, we have so much addiction too. To, uh, to, to bigness. Uh, but this is America, and people have always thought about, uh, you know, uh, conquering uh, space, and by that I mean not only outer space, but the space on this continent. Mm -hmm. and uh, taming the wilderness and occupying so much of our, our territory. And we have so much more land that we could expand into. It seems that, uh, and, and with a growing population, that we're gonna get another 30, 40, 50 million people on this, on this continent, that we've got lots of room to grow and we could have a bigger economy. What's wrong with more? Well, maybe it's not a problem because eventually we're gonna be um, sustainable because we won't be able to afford to uh, be unsustainable in terms of gas prices alone and then everything else. So I guess that is encouraging if nothing else. Nature always gets its way, although sometimes nature gets its way and makes the species extinct like human beings, but uh, hopefully we'll figure out our own way before that happens. Right. So you're sensing we're going to hit a wall at some point. I think we're hitting it now. I think yeah. we hit it occasionally and right now we're hitting it pretty hard. I, I think that that's part of the message of the exhibition that, that's at the Museum Small Worlds, is that, you know, there's sort of, sort of sense that we're bumping up against something that we've we got to be really careful about. Yeah, I'm encouraged to see art going in this direction. It seems more and more talking about our current situation in a, in a very practical way, you know, showing, showing the worst and the best potentials. Right. But... At the same time, a lot of people are saying that cities are incredibly important and very green because uh, when you concentrate people in a densely packed urban environment and they use mass transit, that's actually a very green way to live. And you mentioned uh, living in the shared walls of, of an apartment, that's more energy efficient. And also people are creative when they're bumping into one another. So I, I guess I'm kind of, I'm a little concerned about the solitary person <laughs> living in, in the house uh, out there. and. Uh, what are your thoughts about, about that, about urban versus rural? Well, I think that that balances out because um, people who are total introverts will live rural and people who aren't won't live rural, generally speaking. Hopefully they don't get forced into a situation. But I think, uh, I think there's a, in my head, there's always a balance. I actually have a hard time in New York City because I'm so easily overly overstimulated. Mm. Um, and a lot of that has to do, I love high density, but it's got to be accompanied by good design, and there's some good design in New York City, and then you get on a street where it's not really designed for um, right. all the people in Times Square on a Saturday night. So ultimately, are you an optimist or a pessimist about us living on this continent? I want to say I'm an optimist because it makes me sound like a positive person, and I honestly can say that I am an optimist because otherwise I would just turn really bitter really fast, but yeah. I don't... You know, I guess I don't believe in just looking the other way either. I can see that uh, not everything's perfect these days by a long shot. Well, I, I have to say, I think that the appeal of the vision that you're putting forward is, uh, is that it, it does seem very positive. It's a happy looking house. And I think you're really um, making us think about these issues in a really constructive way. 
Thank you, Steve. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, I'd love to, thanks. <laughs> very bright up here. It's a little hard for me to see out there, but I hear we have microphones in the audience, and we would love to hear from all of you if uh, there are any questions out, out there. Surely uh, some folks have been thinking about maybe you want to, oh great, we have house lights coming up. It's wonderful. Yes, sir. Uh, is, is there a microphone that uh, can reach over there? Oh my gosh, there are people out there. Yes, yes. We've been talking <laughs> in front of this wonderful group tonight. Is that possible? Okay, so we have two, two mics here on either side, and I guess people can uh, come down the, the side aisle to, uh, to ask a question. I just wanted to ask about the utilities connections, and have you tried solar panels on any of your houses? Yeah, um, I actually uh, used a solar panel with my first house and with my Airstream trailer. Um, since then, it's not as convenient or as, and as sustainable as just hooking up to the power grid that happens to be right next door. Um, but I'd like to put the panels off to the side so I can, can keep the houses in the shade in the summer, which makes it all the more efficient. But I, uh, in fact, I like putting them on wheels, little carts, so they're like the satellite unit of the tiny house on wheels. Thank you. How, how old were you when you first had the idea? Um, I don't even really know because it was an evolution thing. I think I started designing houses. I remember in uh, high school architecture class, my, the house model I built was probably like 3,000 square feet. So it just evolved from there, subtractive design. And I started realizing, oh, it's better when you get rid of all this, this extra stuff. I was always into Disney architecture too. I love the way they boil everything down for you in terms of the vernacular, like go over here, you see the uh, African vernacular, and you go over here, it's American uh, early vernacular. Yeah, well, well this, uh, right, we have another question uh, coming up in a moment. Have you um, thought about touring the world and seeing where other people are already living small? What is the uh, vernacular capital of small living uh, in, in the world? It's hard to say. I mean, you know, you go down to the Bowery and you see people living in cardboard boxes and you don't have to go very far at all. Um, but, I mean, I guess I hear that the Bushmen of Africa act are, are one of the happiest cultures around and they have less stuff than basically any other culture. So that's encouraging. Mm. Um, interestingly, we have more stuff than more cult most cultures and we're one of the more depressed people around <laughs> and anxious. So there might be a correlation there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, do we have a question down here? I understand that the tiny houses are difficult to insure and that you are seeking to have them reclassified as an RV. Can you give us more information about that? Yeah, once you're outside the box, it's hard to insure things and even get financing on them. So we've been working to make sure we meet RV code, which is very minimal compared to housing code or building code. So I think we've got all the designs now meeting tra like RV code so that we can um, classify them as RVs and it's just gonna be make things a lot easier for everyone. We can just start, then we can just start taking over the world with tiny houses. So going forward, the, the designs that you have available at this point would be considered RVs? Yeah, all of the ones on wheels and then the bigger ones are on foundations once you get above like uh, well, above 400 square feet, since some of them, I'm designing a bunch of 400 square footers on wheels right now, which will come out in a few months. Thank you. And that's bigger than the other tiny ones on, on wheels that we've done. Okay, thank Let's go over this side. Well, I guess my question kind of touches on the last one. Um, I guess the first step is building the house, and then um, where, where do most of the people put these little houses? Um, do they have their own land, or...? Do they go in an RV park or? Well, I can tell you from my own experience that almost anything seems possible, whether it be legal or illegal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> after I built my first house in the hayfield and wanted to move into town, I found out you can't just pull your house onto a residential, or your trailer onto a residential lot and camp out there indefinitely and buy that lot. So the, the city told me it was, uh, on, the, on the contrary, you could buy a house 
and then store your RV in your yard and camp out in your RV as much as you wanted. So I bought the cheapest house in town. It happened to be for sale, totally derelict house. And I camped out for five years in my own backyard while renting out that larger structure. <laughs> that's, just, that's just one extreme, but um, I've lived in apple orchards that I've rented space in, and uh, I lived in the redwoods renting a space. So you can rent or, you know, lo most people these days would love to have an extra 50 to 100 bucks uh, a month from somebody living in their backyard. You know, Jay, I've got to jump in here before we have our next question. Where is your drawing board? You know, my desk is always bigger proportionally. Storage and my desk are big. I don't have a drawing board. Um, I just have some grid paper and a pencil and an eraser in my desk. So do you work on that small surface and design it's small a, drawings? Fairly small. Although I, I teach these workshops and there's this type, of course, that comes to the workshop and dr literally draws drawings like two inches tall, even though they could f fill the whole page. But I don't do that. You I don't have the, whole the, the, the big Oh, drawing board with the sheets of paper that are going like this. No, actually, when I um, when I was doing more like gallery or artsy stuff, I even had to pare down from fairly large four by four paintings and whatnot, and I, I went down to book pages from like standard size books, seven yeah. by four inches. And at a certain point, it's like I don't think I need to do four by four feet. This is going to save me a lot of trouble. Yeah. And storage. Okay. Let's go over here. Was oh, there a new question over here? Yeah. Hi. Uh, over the past couple of years, I've noticed a lot of, um, on, on different design blogs and architecture magazines, uh, little projects of housing pods put in on top of roofs in big cities. And it made me wonder whether or not you've thought much about how the tiny houses could be integrated into more vertical cities, because oftentimes it's very horizontal. Yeah, I, you know, that question about um, where you might put a house I thought about it a lot. I like the idea of water world. I've never seen the movie, but I imagine a whole village on the water with no taxation. Um, I love the idea. I actually, early on, I photoshopped one of my designs onto the roof of a urban uh, building just to show that it could be done. And, um, you know, I, I say that I've gotten out of the, uh, the drawing and painting thing, but now I, I probably spend more time photoshopping tiny houses into landscapes than I ever did drawing or painting anyway. <laughs> Not that they all are, but some of them are. Yeah. Thank you. Um, anyway, answer to your question, totally doable. Just get, get a crane, and I love the idea of putting a bunch stacked between tall buildings on uh, some, some sort of shelving system. You'd have to have the right, you know, plumbing, a drainage system, and... Yeah, you wouldn't want to have the gray water system. Yeah, right, and, and you have to have, you know, the roof that can handle one of these things, and, you know, most yeah. roofs are not dead level, so... That's a good disclaimer. Do not just stick a house on a roof unless you've checked out the roof <laughs> right. first. Okay, question over here. Okay, I think we're, this is going to be our uh, last question, and then we'll wrap up, okay? Back in the 70s, there was a small series of books called A Pattern Language. Um, I wasn't sure if you were aware of that, and if you were, did it have any influence on your design process? Yeah, you know, most people read those pattern language books, I think, kind of like just a reference book. You go in and you check out some information here or there, like an encyclopedia, but I read it like a novel. I should interject that the, uh, the questioner is talking about the... Uh, architecture professor at Berkeley named Christopher Alexander, and these, these books are actually immense. They're not small books. They're, you know, very thick. Well, uh, I think there tones. were only three books in the, in the series, though. That's what I meant by a small series, not the size yeah. of the books okay. themselves. <laughs> they, are, they are thick books. They're, uh, yeah, I read through the main one. Yeah. And it's a great itinerary of things you should not, that you don't want to consider not forgetting when you build a built environment. So I, uh, I went through this like, oh yeah, a surface next to the door so you can set your, down your groceries when you're digging for your keys. That's a good one. And I, I've made up my own list, boiled down from that list. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think we're done. Thank All right, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.